Act One of The Dream by Joanna Bailey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Persons of the Drama Ostalu, an Imperial General. Read by Thomas Peter. Prior of the Monastery. Read by Larry Wilson. Benedict, a monk. Read by Todd. Jerome, a monk. Read by Gauguin. Paul, a monk. Read by T. J. Burns. Morant, officer in the service of the prior. Read by Chuck Williamson. Wovelraid, officer in the service of the prior. Read by Voxandis. Leonora. Read by Sonia. Agnes. Read by Abai. The Imperial Ambassador third peasant a woman first woman sexton read by lian yao first officer serving under ostalu third servant read by eva davis first peasant first servant first executioner read by phone second peasant second servant first monk read by trisha g fourth peasant an old woman second executioner read by april first soldier read by roger moline second soldier read by alan mapstone third soldier read by nemo peasant a lay brother the first gentleman read by philip gould a monk read by jim locke stage directions read by sandra schmidt scene the monastery of st maurice in switzerland a castle near it time the middle of the fourteenth century the dream act one scene one a court within the monastery with a grated iron gate opening into an outer court through which are seen several peasants waiting jerome is discovered on the front of the stage walking backwards and forwards in a disturbed manner then stopping and speaking to himself twice in one night the same awful vision repeated and paul also terrified with a similar visitation this is no common accidental mimicry of sleep the shreds and remnants of our day thoughts put together at night in some fantastic incongruous form as the drifting clouds of a broken-up storm piece themselves again into uncertain shapes of rocks and animals no no there must be some great and momentous meaning in this enter benedict behind him some great and momentous meaning in this what art thou musing upon be satisfied be satisfied it is not always fitting that the mind should lay open the things it is busy with all though an articulate sound may sometimes escape it to set curiosity on the rack where is brother paul is he still at his devotions i believe so but look for the poor peasants are waiting without it is the hour when they expect our benefactions go and speak to them thou hast always been their favorite confessor and they want consolation beckoning the peasants who thereupon advance through the gate while jerome stretches out his hand to prevent them stop there come not within the gates i charge you advance no farther to benedict angrily there's death and contagion in every one of them and yet thou wouldst admit them so near us dost thou indeed expect a miracle to be wrought in our behalf are we not flesh and blood and does not the grave yawn for us as well as other men to the peasants still more vehemently turn i charge you and retire without the gate oh be not so stern with us good father there are ten new corpses in the village since yesterday and scarcely ten men left in it with strength enough to bury them the best half of the village are now underground who but three weeks gone by were all alive and well oh do not chide us away god knows if any of us shall ever enter these gates again and it revives us to come once a day to receive your blessings good fathers well and you shall have our blessing my children 
but come not so near us we are mortal men like yourselves and there is contagion about you ah no no saint maurice will take care of his own there is no fear of you fathers i hope he will but it is presumptuous to tempt danger retire i beseech you and you shall have relief given to you without the gates if you have any love for us retire the peasants retire well i feel a strong faith within me that our saint or some other good spirit will take care of us how is it that thou art so alarmed and so vehement with these good people it is not thy usual temper be satisfied i pray thee i cannot tell thee now leave me to myself a little while would to god brother paul were come to me ha here he is enter paul and jerome after waiting impatiently till benedict retires advances to him eagerly was it to a spot near the black monument in the stranger's burying vault that it pointed yes to the very spot described by thee yesterday morning when thou first toldst me of thy dream and indeed every circumstance of my last night's vision strongly resembled thine or rather i should say was the same the fixed frown of its ghastly face ay and the majestic motion of its limbs did it not wear a mantle over its right shoulder as if for concealment rather than grace i know not i did not mark that but it strode before me as distinctly as ever mortal man did before my waking sight and yet as no mortal man ever did before the waking sight but it appeared to thee only once only once for i waked under such a deep horror that i durst not go to sleep again when it first appeared to me as i told thee the night before last the form though distinctly was but faintly imaged forth and methought it rose more powerfully to my imagination as i told it to thee than in the dream itself but last night when it returned it was far more vivid than before i waked indeed as thou didst impressed with a deep horror yet irresistible sleep seized upon me again and oh how it appeared to me the third time like a palpable horrid reality after a pause what is to be done what can be done we can stop no division of the imperial army till one shall really march by this pass and this is not likely for i received a letter from a friend two days ago by an express messenger who says he had delayed sending it hoping to have it conveyed to me by one of count osterlo's soldiers who with his division should have marched through our pass but was now he believed to conduct them by a different route what noise and commotion is that near the gate calling to those without ho oh, there what is the matter first peasant without nothing father but we hear a trumpet at a distance and they say there is an army marching amongst the mountains by all our holy saints if it be so calling again to the first peasant are you sure it is trumpets you hear as sure as we ever heard any sound and here's a lad too who saw from the topmost crag with his own eyes their banners waving at a distance jerome to paul what thinkst thou of it we must go to the prior and reveal the whole to him directly our own lives and those of the whole brotherhood depend upon it there can be no hesitation now come then lose no time we have a solemn duty imposed upon us exeunt scene two an open space by the gate of the monastery with the view of the building on one side while rocks and mountains wildly grand appear in every other direction and a narrow pass through the mountains opening to the bottom of the stage several peasants both men and women are discovered waiting as if to see some sight a trumpet and warlike music heard at a little distance hear how it echoes amongst the rocks it is your true warlike sound that makes a man's heart stir within him and his feet beat the ground to its measure ah what have our hearts to do with it now miserable as we are 
what have we to do with it speak for thyself were i to be laid in the grave this very night it would rouse me to hear those sounds which remind me of the battle of Lopen. well look not too proudly at me though i have not yet fought for my country i am of a good stock nevertheless my father lost his life at morgarton calling up to morant who now appears scrambling down the sides of the rocks are they near us lieutenant they'll be here in a trice i know their ensigns already they are those brave fellows under the command of count osterloo who did such good service to the emperor in his last battle ay they be goodly men no doubt and bravely accoutred i warrant ye ay there be many a brave man amongst them i trow returning to his mother again my hubert never returned second peasant to morant count osterloo who is he didst thou never hear of him <laughs> he has been in as many battles as thou hast been in harvest fields and won them too nay some of them he has won and some he has lost but whether his own side were fighting or flying he always kept his ground or retreated like a man the enemy never saw his back true lieutenant i once knew an old soldier of osterloo's who boasted much of his general for his men are proud of him and would go through flood and flame for his sake yes he is affable and indulgent to them although passionate and unreasonable when provoked and has been known to punish even his greatest favourite severely for a slight offence i remember well the officer i first served under being a man of this kidney and hist, hist. the gates are thrown open and yonder come the monks in procession with the prior at their head enter prior and monks from the monastery and range themselves on one side of the stage prior to the peasants retire my children and don't come so near us don't stand near the soldiers as they pass neither but go to your houses oh bless saint maurice and your holy reverence we see nothing now but coffins and burials and hear nothing but the ticking of the death watch and the tolling of bells do let us stand here and look at the brave sight lord knows if any of us may be above ground to see such another and it were to pass this way but a week hence be it so then daughter but keep at a distance on the rocks where you may see everything without communicating infection the peasants retire climbing amongst the rocks then enter by the narrow pass at the bottom of the stage soldiers marching to martial music with officers and osterloo prior advancing and lifting up his hands with solemnity soldiers and officers and the noble chief commanding this band in the name of our patron saint maurice once like yourselves a valiant soldier upon earth now a holy powerful saint in heaven i conjure you to halt first officer in the foremost rank say you so reverend prior to men pressing forward as we do to shelter our heads for the night and that cold wintry sun going down so fast upon us by my faith if we pass the night here amongst the mountains it will take something besides prayers and benedictions to keep us alive spend the night here among chamois and eagles some miracle no doubt will be wrought for our accommodation murmur not my friends here comes your general who is always careful of you Ostadu, advancing from the rear what is the matter prior to Ostadu, you are the commander-in-chief yes reverend father and with all respect and deference let me say the night advances fast upon us martigny is still at a good distance and we must not be detained with many thanks then for your intended civilities we beg your prayers holy prior with those of your pious monks and crave leave to pass on our way prior lifting his hands as before if there be any piety in brave men 
i conjure you in the name of st maurice to halt the lives of our whole community depend upon it men who for your lives have offered to heaven many prayers how may this be my lord who will attack your sacred walls that you should want any defence we want not general the service of your arms my own troops with the brave captain who commands them are sufficient to defend us from mortal foes must we fight with devils then must we fight with devils then must we fight with the devils then be quiet my good comrades to priam well my lord proceed a fatal pestilence rages in this neighbourhood and by command of a vision which has appeared three times to the senior of our order and also to another of our brotherhood threatening in case of disobedience that the whole community shall fall victims to the dreadful disease we are compelled to conjure you to halt and for what purpose that we may choose by lot from the first division of the imperial army which marches through this pass so did the vision precisely direct us a man who shall spend one night within the walls of our monastery there to undergo certain penances for the expiation of long concealed guilt this is very strange by lot did you say it will be tedious there are a hundred of my men who will volunteer this service what say ye soldiers willingly general if you desire it yet i marvel what greater virtue there can be in beleaguering the war-worn hide of a poor soldier than the fat sides of a well-fed monk wilt thou do it then ay and more than that willingly for my general it is not the first time a cat o nine tails has been across my back for other men's misdeeds promise me a good flask of brandy when i'm done with it and i warrant ye i'll never winch as to the saying of paternosters if there be anything of that kind tacked to it i let you to wit my dexterity is but small then be it as thou wilt my good friend yet i had as lief my own skin should smart for it as thine thou art such a valiant fellow no noble general this must not be we must have our man chosen by lot the lives of the whole community depending upon it we must strictly obey the vision it will detain us long nay my lord the lots are already prepared in the first place six men only shall draw four representing the soldiers and two the officers if the soldiers are taken they shall draw by companies and the company that is taken shall draw individually but if the lot falls to the officers each of them shall draw for himself let it be so you have arranged it well produce the lots the prior giving the sign a monk advances bearing a stand on which are placed three vases and sets it near the front of the stage now brave soldiers let four from your body advance ostalu points to four men who advance from the ranks and two from the officers my lord even so noble count Ostalu then points to two officers who with the four soldiers draw lots from the smallest vase directed by the prior first soldier speaking to his comrades as the others are drawing this is strange mummery of faith but it would have been no joke i suppose to have offended st maurice prior after examining the lots soldiers ye are free it is your officers who are taken first soldier as before ha the vision is dainty it seems it is not vulgar blood like ours that will serve to stain the ends of his holy lash a monk having removed two of the vases the prior beckons the officers to draw from the remaining one stand not on order let him who is nearest put in his hand first first soldier aside to the others as the officers are drawing now by these arms i would give a month's pay that the lot should fall on our prim pompous lieutenant 
it would be well worth the money to look in at one of their narrow windows and see his dignified backbone winching under the hands of a good brawny friar Osterloo, aside unrolling his lot mighty heaven is fate or chance in this first officer aside to Osterloo. have you got it general change it for mine if you have no no my noble albert let us be honest but thanks to thy generous friendship now show the lots all the officers show their lots excepting Osterloo, who continues gloomy and thoughtful has no one drawn the sable scroll of election to Osterloo. you are silent my lord of what colour is your lot Osterloo, holding out his scroll black as midnight soldiers quit their ranks and crowd round Osterloo tumultuously has it fallen upon our general tis a damned lot an unfair lot we will not leave him behind us though a hundred st maurice's commanded it get within your walls again ye cunning friars and we should be in the open air all night we will not leave brave Osterloo behind us prior to Osterloo. count you seem gloomy and irresolute have the goodness to silence these clamours i am in truth as sorry as any of your soldiers can be that the lot has fallen upon you first officer aside to Osterloo. nay my noble friend let me fulfil this penance in your stead it is not now a time for scruples the soldiers will be mutinous mutinous soldiers return to your ranks looking at them sternly as they seem unwillingly to obey will you brave me so far that i must repeat my command they retire i thank thee dear albert to first officer thou shalt do something in my stead but it shall not be the service thou thinkest of to prior reverend father i am indeed somewhat struck at being marked out by fate from so many men but as to how i shall act thereupon no wise irresolute to the soldiers continue your march the brave albert shall conduct you to martigny and there you will remain under his command till i join you again god preserve you then my noble general and if you do not join us again by to-morrow evening safe and sound we will not leave one stone of that building standing on another so, so swear we all so swear we all Osterloo, assuming a cheerful look go to foolish fellows were you to leave me in a den of lions you could not be more apprehensive we're watching all night by some holy shrine or walking barefoot through their midnight aisles be such a hardship to one who has passed so many nights with you all on the cold field of battle continue your march without delay else these good fathers will count you no better than a band of new raised city troops with some jolly tangled chief for your leader a good march to you my friends with kind hostesses and warm firesides where you are going ah what good will our firesides do us when we think how our general is lodged farewell march on as quickly as you may you shall all drink my health to-morrow evening in a good hogshead of rhenish god grant we may to prior look to it reverend prior if our general be not with us by to-morrow's sunset st maurice shall neither have monastery nor monks on this mountain no more embracing first officer and shaking hands with others farewell farewell the soldiers after giving him a loud cheer march off with their officers to martial music and exeunt Osterloo, prior and monks into the monastery while the peasants disappear amongst the rocks Manand, Morand, and Agnes, who has for some time appeared, looking over a crag. Morand! Morand! <laughs> Art thou there? 
I might have guessed, indeed, that so brave a sight would not escape thee. What made thee perch thyself like an eagle upon such a crag as that? Ah, chide not, good Moron, but help me down, lest I pay a dearer price for my sight than thou, with all thy grumbling, wouldst wish. He helps her down. And now thou art going, no doubt, to tell the Lady Leonora what a band of gallant fellows thou hast seen. Assuredly, if I can find in my heart to speak of any but their noble leader. What is his name? What meaning had all that drawing of lots in it? What will the monks do with him? Walk with me a little way towards the castle, brave Moron, and tell me what thou knowest. I should walk to the castle and miles beyond it, too, ere I could answer so many questions. And I have duty in the monastery, besides. Come with me a little way, at least. Which? Thou knowest too well that I must always do what thou biddest me. Exeunt. Scene three. The refectory of the monastery, with a small table on which are placed refreshments, discovered in one corner. Enter Osterlu, Prior, Benedict, Jerome, and Paul, etc. Noble Osterlu, let me welcome you here as one appointed by heaven to purchase our deliverance from this dreadful malady and i hope the price to be paid for it will not be a heavy one yet ere we proceed further in this matter be entreated i pray to take some refreshment after your long march the table is placed near the front of the stage uh, thank you my lord this is a gentle beginning to my penance i will then by your leave sitting down at the table I have fasted long, and am indeed somewhat exhausted. After taking some refreshment. Ah, my poor soldiers. You must still endure two hours' weary march before you find such indulgence. Your wine is good, reverend father. I am glad you find it so. It is old. And your viands are good too, and your bread is delicious. Drinking another cup. I shall have vigour now for anything. Pray tell me something more of this wonderful vision. Was it a saint or an angel that appeared to the senior brother? Prior, pointing to Jerome. He will answer for himself. And? Pointing to Paul. This man saw it also. It was neither angel nor saint, noble count, but a mortal form wonderfully noble. And it appeared to you in the usual manner of a dream. It did. At least I know no sensible distinction. A wavy envelopment of darkness preceded it, from which appearances seemed dimly to wake into form, till all was presented before me in the full strength of reality. Nay, brother, it broke upon me at once, a vivid, distinct apparition. Well, be that as it may. What did appear to you? A mortal man, and very noble? Yes, General. Methought I was returning from Mass, through the cloisters that led from the chapel, when a figure, as I have said, appeared to me, and beckoned me to follow it. I did follow it, for at first I was neither afraid nor even surprised, but so wonderfully it rose in stature and dignity as it strode before me, that ere it reached the door of the stranger's burying vault, I was struck with unaccountable awe. The stranger's burying vault. Does any sudden thought strike you, Count? No, no. Here's your health, father. Drinking. Your wine is excellent. But that is the water you have just now swallowed. This is the wine. Ha! <laughs> is it? No matter, no matter. It is very good, too. A long pause, Osterloo with his eyes fixed thoughtfully on the ground. Shall not our brother proceed with his story, General? Most certainly. I have been listening for it. Well, then, as I have said, at the door of the stranger's burying vault it stopped and beckoned me again. It entered, and I followed it 
There, through the damp, mouldering tombs, it strode still before me, till it came to the farther extremity, as nearly as I could guess, two yards westward from the black marble monument, and then, stopping and turning on me its fixed and ghastly eyes, it stretched out its hands. Its hands? Did you say its hands? It stretched out one of them. The other was covered with its mantle and in a voice that sounded i know not how it sounded ay brother it was something like a voice at least it conveyed words to the mind though it was not like a voice neither be that as you please these words it solemnly uttered command the brothers of this monastery on pain of falling victims to the pestilence now devastating the country to stop on its way the first division of the imperial army that shall march through your mountain pass and choose from it by lot a man who shall abide one night within these walls to make expiation for long concealed guilt let the suffering be such as the nature of the crime and the connection of the expiator therewith shall dictate this spot of earth shall reveal it said no more but bent its eyes steadfastly upon me with a stern threatening frown which became as it looked keener than the looks of any mortal being and vanished from my sight ay that look that last terrible look it awoke me with terror and i know not how it vanished this has been repeated to me three times last night twice in the course of the night while brother paul here was at the same time terrified with a similar apparition this you will acknowledge count was no common visitation and could not but trouble us you say well yet it was but a dream true it was but a dream and as such these pious men strove to consider it when the march of your troops across our mountains a thing so unlikely to happen compelled them to reveal to me without loss of time what had appeared to them a tall figure you say and of a noble aspect like that of a king though habited more in the garb of a foreign soldier of fortune than of a state so dignified ostalu rises from the table agitated what is the matter general will you not finish your repast i thank you i've had enough the night grows cold i would rather walk than sit going hastily to the bottom of the stage and pacing to and fro jerome aside to paul and the prior what think ye of this his countenance changed several times as he listened to you and there is something here different from common surprise on hearing a wonderful thing enter a peasant by the bottom of the stage bearing a torch Peasant eagerly as he enters. We have found it. Ostalu, stopping short in his walk. What hast thou found? What the prior desired us to dig for. What is that? A grave. Ostalu turns from him suddenly and paces up and down very rapidly. Prior to peasant. Thou hast found it. I please you in the very spot near the black monument where your reverence desired us to dig and it is well you sent for my kinsman and i to do it for there is not a lay brother in the monastery strong enough to raise up the great stones that covered it in the very spot sayest thou in the very spot bear thy torch before us and we'll follow thee let, let us go, go immediately. immediately prior to Osterloo, who stands fixed to the spot will not count osterloo go also it is fitting that he should osterloo rousing himself oh most assuredly i am perfectly ready to follow you exeunt end of act one act two of the dream by joanna bailey this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Act Two, Scene One, a burying vault almost totally dark, the monuments and gravestones being seen very dimly by the light of a single torch stuck by the side of a deep open grave in which a sexton is discovered standing leaning on his mattock and morant above ground turning up with his sheathed sword the loose earth about the mouth of the grave there is neither skull nor bone amongst this earth the ground must have been newly broken up when that coffin was let down into it so one should think but the earth here has the quality of consuming whatever is put into it in a marvellous short time ay the flesh and more consumable parts of a body but hath it grinders in its jaws like your carnivorous animal to cranch up bones and all i have seen bones on an old field of battle some hundred years after the action lying whitened and hard in the sun well ain't be new ground i warrant ye somebody has paid money enough for such a good tenement as this i could not wish my own father a better morant looking down the coffin is of an uncommon size there must be a leaden one within it i should think i doubt that it is only a clumsy shell that has been put together in haste and i'll be hanged if he who made it ever made another before it now it would pine me with vexation to think i should be laid in such a bungled piece of workmanship as this ay it is well for those who shall bury thee sexton that thou wilt not be a looker-on at thine own funeral put together in haste sayest thou how long may it be since this coffin was laid in the ground by my fay now i cannot tell though many a grave i have dug in this vault instead of the lay brothers who are mighty apt to take a colic or shortness of breath or the like when anything of hard labour falls to their share after pausing ha huh. now i have it when i went over the mountains some ten years ago to visit my father-in-law baldwick the stranger who died the other day after living so long as a hermit amongst the rocks came here and it was shrewdly suspected he had leave from our late prior for a good sum of money to bury a body privately in this vault i was a fool not to think of it before this i'll be sworn for it is the place enter the prior ostalu jerome paul benedict and other monks with the peasant carrying light before them they enter by an arched door at the bottom of the stage and walk on to the front when every one but ostalu crowds eagerly to the grave looking down into it prior to sexton what hast thou found friend a coffin ain't please you and of a size too that might almost contain a giant the inscription, the inscription. The inscription. is there an inscription on it no no they who put these planks together had no time for inscriptions break it open break it open break it open break it open break it open, break it open. Break it open. they crowd more eagerly about the grave when after a pause the sexton is heard wrenching open the lid of the coffin what is there what in is it there in what it? is there in it what hast thou found sexton an entire skeleton and of no common size is it entire sexton after a pause no the right hand is wanting and there is not a loose bone in the coffin ostalu shudders and steps back jerome to prior after a pause will you not speak to him father his countenance is changed and his whole frame seems moved by some sudden convulsion the prior remains silent how is this you are also changed reverend father shall i speak to him speak thou to him jerome to ostalu what is the matter with you general has some sudden malady seized you ostalu to jerome let me be alone with you holy prior let me be alone with you instantly jerome pointing this is the prior he would be alone with you father he would make his confession to you i dare not hear him alone there must be witnesses let him come with me to my apartment jerome to ostalu as they leave the grave 
Let me conduct you, Count. After walking from it some paces. Come on, my lord, why do you stop short? Not this way. Not this way, I pray you. What is it you would avoid? Turn aside, I pray you. I cannot cross over this. Is it the grave you mean? We have left it behind us. Is it not there? It yawns across our path, directly before us. Indeed, my lord, it is some paces behind. There is delusion in my sight, then. Lead me as thou wilt. Exeunt. Scene two. The private apartment of the prior. Enter Benedict, looking round as he enters. Not yet come? Ay, penitence is not very swift of foot. Speaking to himself as he walks up and down. Miserable man, brave, goodly creature, but alas, alas, most subdued, most miserable, and, I fear, most guilty. Enter Jerome. Jerome here! Dost thou know, brother, that the prior is coming here immediately to confess the penitent? Yes, brother, but I am no intruder, for he has summoned me to attend the confession as well as thyself. Methinks some other person of our order, unconcerned with the dreaming part of this business, would have been a less suspicious witness. Suspicious? Am I more concerned in this than any other member of our community? Heaven appoints its own agents as it listeth. The stones of these walls might have declared its awful will as well as the dreams of a poor friar. True, brother Jerome. Could they listen to confessions as he does, and hold reveries upon them afterwards? What dost thou mean with thy reveries and confessions? Did not Paul see the terrible visions as well as I? If thou hadst not revealed thy dream to him, he would have slept sound enough, or, at worst, have but flown over the pinnacles with his old mate, the horned serpent, as usual. And had the hermit Baldwick never made his deathbed confession to thee, thou wouldst never have had such a dream to reveal. Thinkest thou so? Then what brought Osterloh and his troop so unexpectedly by this route? With all thy heretical dislike to miraculous interposition, how wilt thou account for this? If thou hadst no secret intelligence of Osterloo's route to set thy fancy a workin' on the story the hermit confessed to thee, I never wore cowl on my head. Those indeed who hear thee speak so lightly of mysterious and holy things will scarcely believe thou ever didst. But hush, the prior comes with his penitent. Let us have no altercation now. Enter Prior and Osterloo. Prior, after a pause, in which he seems agitated. Now, Count Osterloo, we are ready to hear your confession. To myself and these pious monks, men appointed by our holy religion to search into the crimes of the penitent, unburthen your heart of its terrible secret, and God grant you afterwards, if it be his righteous will, repentance and mercy. Osterloo, making a sign as if unable to speak, then uttering rapidly presently presently don't hurry him reverend father he cannot speak take breath a while noble osterloo and speak to us when you can i thank you he is much agitated to osterloo lean upon me my lord prior to benedict nay you exceed in this to osterloo Recollect yourself, General, and try to be more composed. You seem better now. Endeavor to unburden your mind of its fatal secret. To have it laboring within your breast is protracting a state of misery. I have voice now. Jerome to Osterloo. Given to heaven, then, as you ought. Hush, brother Jerome. No exhortations now. Let him speak it as he can. To Osterloo. We attend you most anxiously. Osterloo, after struggling for utterance. I slew him. The man whose bones have now been discovered. The same. I slew him. In the field, Count? No, no. Many a man's blood has been on my hands there. 
this is on my heart it is then premeditated murder you have committed call it so call it so jerome to osterloo after a pause and is this all will you not proceed to tell us the circumstances attending it no they were terrible but they are all in my mind as the indistinct horrors of the frenzied imagination after a short pause i did it in a narrow pass on the saint Gotthard, in the stormy twilight of a winter day you murdered him there i felt him dead under my grasp but i looked at him no more after the last desperate thrust that i gave him i hurried to a distance from the spot when a servant who was with me seized with a sudden remorse begged leave to return and remove the body that if possible he might bury it in consecrated ground is an atonement for the part he had taken in the terrible deed i gave him leave with means to procure his desire i waited for him three days concealed in the mountains but i neither saw him nor heard of him again but what tempted a brave man like Osterloo to commit such a horrible act the torments of jealousy stung me to it hiding his face with his hands and then uncovering it I loved her and was beloved he came a noble stranger ay if he was in his mortal state as i in my dream beheld him he was indeed most noble Osterloo waving his hand impatiently well well he did come then and she loved me no more with arts and enchantments he besotted her even from her own lips i received tossing up his arms violently and then covering his face as before but what is all this to you maimed as he was having lost his right arm in a battle with the turks i could not defy him to the field after passing two nights in all the tossing agony of a damned spirit i followed him on his journey across the mountains on the twilight of the second day i laid wait for him in a narrow pass and as soon as his gigantic form darkened the path before me uh, i have told you all you have not told his name did i not say in montera he was a noble hungarian he was so he was so he was noble and beloved jerome aside to prior what is the matter with you reverend father was he your friend prior aside to jerome speak not to me now but question the murderer as ye will benedict overhearing the prior he is indeed a murderer reverend father but he is our penitent go to what are names ask him what questions you will and finish the confession quickly benedict to Osterloo. but have you never till now confessed this crime nor in the course of so many years reflected on its dreadful turpitude the active and adventurous life of a soldier is most adverse to reflection but often in the stillness of midnight the remembrance of this terrible deed has come powerfully upon me till morning returned and the noise of the camp began and the fortunes of the day were before me thou hast indeed been too long permitted to remain in this hardened state but heaven sooner or later will visit the man of blood with its terrors sooner or later he shall feel that he stands upon an awful brink and short is the step which engulfs him in that world where the murdered and the murderer meet again in the tremendous presence of him who is the lord and giver of life 
You believe, then, in such severe retribution? I believe in it as in my own existence. Ostalu, turning to Jerome and Benedict. And you, good fathers, you believe in this? Nature teaches this, as well as revelation. We must believe it. Some presumptuous minds, dazzled with the sunshine of prosperity, have dared to doubt. But to us, in the sober shade of life, visited too, as we have now been by visions preternatural and awful, it is a thing of certainty rather than of faith. That such things are, it makes the brain confused and giddy. These are tremendous thoughts. Leans his back against the wall and gazes fixedly on the ground. Let us leave him to the bitterness of his thoughts. We now must deliberate with the brethren on what is to be done. There must be no delay. The night advances fast. Conduct him to another apartment. I must assemble a council of the whole order. Jerome to Ostalu. We must lead you to another apartment, Count, while we consider what is to be done. Ostalu, roused. Aye. The expiation, you mean. Let it be severe. If atonement in this world may be made. Turning to Prior, as Jerome leads him off. Let your expiation be severe, Holy Father. A slight penance matches not with such a crime as mine. Be well assured, it shall be what it ought. Ostalu, turning again and catching hold of the Prior's robe. I regard not bodily pain. In battle once, with the head of a broken arrow in my thigh, I led on the charge, and sustained all the exertions of a well-fought field, till night closed upon our victory. Let your penance be severe, my reverend father. I have been long acquainted with pain. Exeunt Ostalu and Jerome You seem greatly moved, father. But it is not with pity for the wretched. You would not destroy such a man as this, though his crime is the crime of blood? He shall die. Ere another sun dawn on these walls, he shall die. Oh, say not so. Think of some other expiation. I would think of another, were there any other more dreadful to him than death. He is your penitent. He is the murderer of my brother. Then heaven have mercy on him, if he must find none here. Montero was your brother? My only brother. It were tedious to tell thee now how I was separated from him after the happy days of our youth. I saw him no more, yet he was still the dearest object of my thoughts. After escaping death in many a battle, he was slain as it was conjectured by banditti, in traveling across the mountains. His body was never discovered. Ah, oh, little did I think it was lying so near me. It is indeed piteous, and you must needs feel it as a brother. But consider the danger we run, should we lay violent hands on an imperial general, with his enraged soldiers within a few hours' march of our walls. I can think of nothing but revenge. Speak to me no more. I must assemble the whole order immediately. Exeunt. Scene 3. Another apartment. Enter Ostalu, as from a small recess at the bottom of the stage, pacing backwards and forwards several times in an agitated manner, then advancing slowly to the front, where he stands musing and muttering to himself for some moments, before he speaks aloud. That this smothered horror should burst upon me at last. And there be really such things as the dark and fancy imageth to itself when the busy day is stilled. An unseen world surrounds us. Spirits and powers and the invisible dead hover near us. But we, in unconscious security, I have slept upon a fearful brink. Every sword that threatened my head in battle had power and its edge to send me to a terrible account. I have slept upon a fearful brink. Am I truly awake? Rubbing his eyes, then grasping several parts of his body, 
first with one hand and then with the other yes yes it is so i am keenly and terribly awake paces rapidly up and down and then stopping short can there be virtue and penances suffered by the body to do away offences of the soul if there be oh if there be let them run on my body with stripes and swathe me round in one continued girth of wounds anything that can be endured here is mercy compared to the dreadful abiding of what may be hereafter enter wovelraid behind followed by soldiers who range themselves at the bottom of the stage ostalu turning round runs up to him eagerly ha ah, my dear albert return to me again with all my noble fellows at thy back pardon me i mistook you for one of my captains i am the prior's captain and those men too they are the prior's soldiers who have been ordered from distant quarters to repair to the monastery immediately in such haste ay in truth we received our orders after sunset and have marched two good leagues since what may this mean faith i know not my duty is to obey the prior and pray to our good saint and whether i am commanded to surprise the stronghold of an enemy or protect an execution it is the same thing to me an execution can aught of this nature be intended you turn pale sir wearing the garb of a soldier you have surely seen blood ere now i have seen too much blood enter prior jerome paul and monks walking in order the prior holding a paper in his hand prior with solemnity count osterloo lieutenant general of our liege lord the emperor authorized by this deed which is subscribed by all the brethren of our holy order here present i pronounce to you our solemn decision that the crime of murder as by the mysterious voice of heaven and your own confession your crime is proved to be can only be expiated by death you are therefore warned to prepare yourself to die this night before daybreak you must be within the inhabitants of another world where may the great maker of us all deal with you in mercy ostalus staggers back from the spot where he stood and remains silent it is a sentence count pronounced against you from necessity to save the lives of our whole community which you yourself have promised to submit to have you anything to say in reply to it nothing my thoughts are gone from me in the darkness of astonishment we are compelled to be thus hasty and severe ere daybreak you must die ere daybreak not even the light of another sun to one so ill prepared for the awful and tremendous state into which you would thrust him this is inhuman it is horrible he was ill prepared for it who with still shorter warning was thrust into that awful state in the narrow pass of st gothard the guilt of murder was not on his soul nay nay holy prior consider this horrible extremity let the pain of the executioner's stroke be twentyfold upon me but thrust me not forth to that state from which my soul recoils with unutterable horror never but once to save the life of a friend did i bend the knee to mortal man in humble supplication i am a soldier in many battles i have bled for the service of my country i am a noble soldier and i was a proud one yet do i thus contend me not my extremity my knees on the ground urge me no further it must not be no respite can be granted ostalu starting up furiously from the ground and drawing his sword then subdue as you may stern priest the strength of a desperate man wolverade and soldiers rush forward getting behind him and surrounding him on every side and after a violent struggle disarm him what a noble fellow this would be to defend a narrow breach 
though he shrinks with such abhorrence from a scaffold it is a piteous thing to see him so beset prior to wolverade what sayest thou fool nay it is no business of mine my lord i confess shall we conduct him to the prison chamber do so and see that he retain no concealed arms about him i obey my lord everything shall be made secure exit ostalu guarded by wolverraid and soldiers and at the same time enter benedict by the opposite side who stands looking after him piteously prior sternly to benedict what brings thee here dost thou repent having refused to concur with us in an act that preserves the community say rather reverend father an act that revenges your brother's death which the laws of the empire should revenge a supernatural visitation of heaven hath commanded us to punish it what dost thou shake thy head thou art of a doubting and dangerous spirit and beware lest sooner or later the tempter do not lure thee into heresy if reason cannot subdue thee authority shall return again to thy cell let me hear of this no more i will reverend father but for the love of our holy saint bethink you ere it be too late that though we may be saved from the pestilence by this bloody sacrifice what will rescue our throats from the swords of austerloo's soldiers when they shall return as they have threatened to demand from us their general give thyself no concern about this my own bands are already called in and a messenger has been dispatched to the abbess matilda her troops in defense of the church will face the best soldiers of the empire but why lose we time in unprofitable contentions go my sons speaking to other monks the night advances fast and we have much to do ere morning knocking hurt without ha ah, who knocks at this untimely hour can the soldiers be indeed returned upon us run to the gate but open it to none Exeon several monks in haste and presently re-enter with the lay brother please ye reverend father the marchioness has sent a messenger from the castle beseeching you to send a confessor immediately to confess one of her women who was taken ill yesterday and is now at the point of death i'm glad it is only this what is the matter with the penitent i know not please you the messenger only said she was taken ill yesterday prior shaking his head ay this malady has got there also i cannot send one of the brothers to bring infection immediately amongst us what is to be done leonora is a most noble lady and the family have been great benefactors to our order i must send somebody to her but he must stop well his nostrils with spicery and leave his upper garment behind him when he quits the infected apartment jerome wilt thou go thou art the favourite confessor with all the women at the castle nay father i must attend on our prisoner here who has most need of ghostly assistance prior to another monk go thou anselmo thou hast given comfort to many a dying penitent i thank you father for the preference but paul is the best of us all for administering comfort to the dying and there is a sickness come over my heart of a sudden that makes me unfit for the office prior to paul thou wilt go then my good son i beseech you don't send me reverend father i never escaped contagion in my life where malady or fever were to be had who will go then a deep silence what has no one faith enough in the protection of saint maurice even purchased as it is about to be by the shedding of human blood to venture upon this dangerous duty i will go then father though i am sometimes of a doubting spirit go and saint maurice protect thee exit benedict let him go it is well that we get rid of him for the night should they happily detain him so long at the castle he is a troublesome close-searching self-willed fellow he hath no zeal for the order 
were a miser to bequeath his possessions to our monastery he would assist the disappointed heir himself to find out a flaw in the deed but retire to your cells my sons and employ yourselves in prayer and devotion till the great bell warn you to attend the execution exeunt scene three an apartment in the castle enter leonora and agnes speaking as they enter but she is asleep now and is so much and so suddenly bitter that the confessor when he comes will be dissatisfied i fear that we have called him from his cell at such an unreasonable hour let him come nevertheless don't send to prevent him he will be unwilling to be detained for they are engaged in no common matters to-night at the monastery count osterloo as i told you before is doing voluntary penance at the shrine of st maurice to stop the progress of this terrible malady i remember thou didst ah marchioness you would not say so thus faintly had you seen him march through the pass with his soldiers he is the bravest and most graceful man though somewhat advanced in years that i ever beheld ah had you but seen him i have seen him agnes and i spoke of him all the while yet you did not tell me this before ah my noble mistress and friend the complexion of your cheek is altered you have indeed seen him and you have not seen him with indifference think as thou wilt about this he was the friend and fellow-soldier of my lord when we first married though before my marriage i had never seen him friend your lord was then in the decline of life there must have been great disparity in their friendship they were friends however for the marquis liked society younger than himself and i who had been hurried into an unequal marriage before i could judge for myself was sometimes foolish enough to compare them together ay that was natural enough and what happened then what happened then drawing herself up proudly nothing happened then but subduing the foolish fancy of a girl which was afterwards amply repaid by the self-approbation and dignity of a woman pardon me madam i ought to have supposed all this but you have been long a widow and osterdu is still unmarried what prevented you when free i was ignorant what the real state of his sentiments had been in regard to me but had this been otherwise received as i was into the family of my lord the undowried daughter of a petty nobleman and left as i now am by his confiding love the sole guardian of his children and their fortunes <laughs> i could never think of supporting a second lord on the wealth entrusted to me by the first to the injury of his children as nothing therefore has ever happened in consequence of this weakness of my youth nothing ever shall this is noble it is right oh, but here comes the father confessor enter benedict you are welcome good father yet i am almost ashamed to see you for our sick person has become suddenly well again and is now in a deep sleep i fear i shall appear to you capricious and inconsiderate in calling you up at so late an hour be not uneasy lady upon this account i am glad to have an occasion for being absent from the monastery for some hours if you will permit me to remain here so long what mean you father benedict your countenance is solemn and sorrowful what is going on at the monastery he shakes his head oh, will they be severe with him in a voluntary penance submitted to for the good of the order what is the nature of the penance it is to continue i am told but one night it will indeed soon be over and will he be gone on the morrow his spirit will but his body remains with us for ever <gasps> death dost thou mean oh, horror horror is this the expiation oh most horrible most unjust 
Indeed, I consider it as such. Though guilty, by his own confession, of murder, committed many years since under the frenzy of passion, it belongs not to us to inflict the punishment of death upon a guilty soul taken so suddenly and unprepared for its doom. Murder? Didst thou say murder? Oh, Osterloo, Osterloo, hast thou been so barbarous? and art thou in this terrible state <laughs> must thou thus end thy days and so near me too you seem greatly moved noble leonora would you could do something more for him than lament leonora catching hold of him eagerly can i do anything speak father oh tell me how i will do anything and everything alas alas my vessels are but few and cannot be assembled immediately force were useless your vassals if they were assembled would not be persuaded to attack the sacred walls of a monastery i did indeed rave foolishly but what else can be done take these jewels and everything of value in the castle if they will bribe those who guard him to let him escape think of it Oh, think well of it, good Benedict. I have heard that there is a secret passage leading from the prison chamber of the monastery under its walls and opening to the free country at the bottom of the rocks. By every holy saint, so there is. And the most sordid of our brothers is entrusted with the key of it. But who will be his conductor? None but a monk of the order may pass the soldiers who guard him and the monk who should do it must fly from his country for ever and break his sacred vows i can oppose the weak fears and injustice of my brethren for the misfortunes and disgust of the world not superstitious veneration for monastic sanctity has covered my head with a cowl but this i cannot do there is the dress of a monk of your order in the old wardrobe of the castle if some person were disguised in it thanks to thee thanks to thee my happy agnes i will be that person i will put on the disguise good father your face gives consent to this if there be time but i left them preparing for the execution there is there is come with me to the wardrobe and we'll set out for the monastery forthwith come come a few moments will carry us there exit hastily followed by Agnes and Benedict. Scene 4. A wood near the castle. The stage quite dark. Enter two servants with torches. This must surely be the entry to the path where my lady ordered us to wait for those same monks. Yes, I know it well, for yonder is the postern. It is the nearest path to the monastery, but narrow and difficult. The night is cold. I hope they will not keep us long waiting. I heard the sound of travellers coming up the eastern avenue, and they may linger belike. For monks are marvellously fond of great people and of strangers, at least the good fathers of our monastery are. Ay, in their late prior's time they lived like lords themselves, and they are not very humble at present. But there's light from the postern, here they come. Enter Benedict, Leonora, disguised like a monk, and Agnes, with a peasant's cloak thrown over her leonora speaking as she enters it is well thought of good benedict go thou before me to gain brother baldwin in the first place and i'll wait without on the spot we have agreed upon until i hear the signal thou comprehendest me completely brother so god speed us both to first servant torchman go thou with me this is the right path i trust fear not father i know it well Exit Benedict and first servant. Leonora to Agnes, while she waves her hand to second servant to retire to a greater distance. After I am admitted to the monastery, fail not to wait for me at the mouth of the secret passage. Fear not. Benedict has described it so minutely, I cannot fail to discover it. <gasps> what steps are those behind us? Somebody following us from the castle? enter third servant in haste there are travellers arrived at the gate and desire to be admitted for the night in an evil hour they come 
return dear agnes and receive them benighted strangers no doubt excuse my absence anyhow go quickly and leave you to proceed alone care not for me there is an energy within me now that bids defiance to fear beckons to second servant who goes out before her with the torch and exit agnes muttering to herself as she turns to the castle the evil spirit hath brought travellers to us at this moment but i'll send them to their chambers right quickly and join her at the secret passage notwithstanding exeunt end of act two act three of the dream by joanna bailey this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org act three scene one the prison chamber of the monastery osterloo is discovered sitting in a bending posture with his clenched hands pressed upon his knees and his eyes fixed on the ground jerome standing by him nay think not thus my son the mercy of heaven is infinite let other thoughts enter thy soul let penitence and devotion subdue it nothing but one short moment of division between the state of humanity and that which is to follow the executioner lets fall his axe and the dark veil is rent the gulf is uncovered the regions of anguish are before me my son my son this must not be thine imagination overpowers thy devotion the dead are there and what welcome shall the murderer receive from that assembled host <sighs> the terrible form that stalks forth to meet me the stretching out of that hand the greeting of that horrible smile and it is thou who must lead me before the tremendous majesty of my offended maker incomprehensible and dreadful what thoughts can give an image of that which overpowers all thought clasping his hands tightly over his head and bending himself almost to the ground jerome after a pause art thou entranced art thou asleep art thou still in those inward agonies of imagination touching him softly speak to me osterloo starting up are they come for me they shall not yet i'll strangle the first man that lays hold of me grasping jerome by the throat let go your hold my lord i did but touch you gently to rouse you from your stupor osterloo lets go of his hold and jerome shrinks to a distance i have grasped thee then too roughly but shrink not from me thus strong men have fallen by my arm but a child might contend with me now throwing himself back again into his chair and bursting into tears forgive me my son there was a wildness in your eyes that made me afraid thou needst not be afraid thou art a good man and has the days of life still before thee thou needst not be afraid but as thou art a good man speak to me i conjure thee as a man not as a monk answer me as the true sense and reason of a man doth convince thee i will my son dost thou in truth believe that the very instant after life has left the body we are forthwith awake and conscious in the world of spirits no intermediate state of slumbering insensibility between it is indeed my belief death is but a short though awful pass as it were a winking of the eyes for a moment we shut them in this world and open them in the next and there we open them with such increased vividness of existence that this life in comparison will appear but as a state of slumber and of dreams but wherefore dost thou cross thine arms so closely on thy breast and coil thyself together so wretchedly 
What is the matter, my son? Art thou in bodily anguish? The chilly night shoots icy coldness through me. Oh, regard not the poor feelings of a fleshly frame, which thou so soon must part withal. A little time will now put an end to every thing that nature can endure. Osterlu, raising his head quickly. How? How soon? Has the bell struck again since I listened to it last? No, but it will soon strike, and daybreak is at hand. Rouse ye then, and occupy the few minutes that remain in acts of devotion becoming thine unhappy state. O oh, my son, pour out thy soul in penitent prayers to an offended but merciful God. We, too, will pray for thee, months, nay years after thy death. Masses shall be said for the repose of thy soul, that it may at last be received into bliss. O oh, my unhappy son, pour forth thy spirit to God, and let thy prayers also ascend to our blessed saint and martyr who will intercede for thee. I, I cannot. I have not thoughts for prayer. The gulf yawns before me the unknown and the unbounded, the unfathomable <laughs> prayers, prayers, what prayers have despair. Hold, hold, refractory spirit, this obstinacy is destruction. I must call in Brother Bernard to assist me. I cannot be answerable alone in a service of such infinite moment. Exit, and after a pause, in which Osterloo seems absorbed in the stupor of despair, enter Leonora, disguised. Leonora, coming eagerly forward, and then stopping short to look at him. There is some mistake in this. It is not Osterloo. It is. It is. But, oh, how changed! Thy hand, great God, has been upon him. Going closer to him. Osterloo! Osterloo. I hear thee, father. Leonora, throwing aside her disguise. Oh, no, it is no father. Lift up thine eyes and see an old friend before thee, with deliverance in her hand. Holding out a key. Osterloo, looking up wildly. Is it a sound in my ears? Or did any one say deliverance? Gazing on her. What thing art thou? A form of magic or delusion? Neither, Count Osterloo, but an old friend bringing this key in her hand for thy deliverance. Yet much I fear thou hast not strength enough to rise and follow me. Osterloo bounding from his seat. I have strength for anything there be deliverance in it. Where go we? They will be upon us immediately. Leonora, lifting a small lamp from the table, and holding it to examine the opposite wall. The door, as he described it, is to the right of a small projection of the wall. Here, here it is. Opens a small door, and beckons Osterloo to follow her. Yes, blessed being, I will follow thee. Ah, oh, they are coming. Strides hastily to the door, while Leonora holds up the lamp to light him into it, and then, going in herself, shuts the door softly behind her. Scene two. An old ruinous vault, with a strong grated door on one side, through which the moonbeams are gleaming. On the other side, an old winding staircase, leading from the upper regions of the monastery, from which a feeble light is seen, increasing by degrees, and presently Leonora appears, descending the stairs with the lamp in her hand, followed by Osterloo. As she enters, Something on the wall catches her robe, and she turns round to disentangle it, bending her face close to the light. Osterloo, stopping to assist her, and then gazing on her. Thou art something I have known and loved somewhere, though it has passed away from my mind with all my better thoughts. Oh, great power of heaven! Art thou Leonora? Leonora, smiling. Dost thou know me now? I do, I do. My heart knew thee before, but my memory did not. 
kneeling and kissing both her hands. And so it is to thee, thou whom I first loved. Pardon me, pardon me, thou whom I loved and dared not love, thou from whom I fled to be virtuous, thou art my deliverer. Oh, had I never loved another after thee, it had been well. Knowest thou it is a murderer thou art saving? Say no more of this. I know thy story, and I came. Oh, thou camest like a blessed spirit to deliver me from many horrors. I was terribly beset. Thou hast snatched me from a tremendous brink. I hope so, if this key prove to be the right one. Dost thou doubt it? It seems to me smaller than it ought to be when I consider that massive door. Give it me. Snatches the key from her and runs to the door, then turns the key in the lock, and finding it too small, stamps with his feet, throws it from him and holds up his clenched hands in despair. Oh, cross fate! But I'll return again for the right one. Baldwin cannot be so wicked as to deceive me and benedict is still on the watch near the door of the prison chamber stay here till i return she ascends the stairs whilst osterloo leans his back to the wall frequently moving his body up and down with impatient agitation a bell tolls osterloo starts from his place and leonora descends again re-entering in great alarm oh i cannot go now that bell tolls to warn them to the great hall i shall meet them on their way what is to be done the strength of three men could not force that heavy door and thou art feeble and spent osterloo running furiously to the door despair has strength for anything seizes hold of the door and making two or three terrible efforts bursts it open with a loud jar supernatural strength has assisted thee now thou art free as Osterloo and Leonora are about to pass on through the door, Wolverite and three armed soldiers appear in the porch beyond it and oppose their passage. Hold. We are the prior soldiers and will suffer no prisoner to escape. Those who dare prevent me. Rests a sword from one of the soldiers and, fighting furiously, forces his way past them all, they not daring to pursue him, when Wolverite seizing on leonora to prevent her from following him she calls out oh let me pass and i'll reward you nobly osterloo returning to rescue leonora let go thine unhallowed grasp for heaven's sake care not for me save thyself save thyself i am in no danger turn not again to fight when such terrible odds are against thee I have arms in my hand now, and my foes are before me. Fights fiercely again, till Morant, with a strong band of soldiers, entering the porch behind him, he's overpowered and secured. Leonora sinks down by the wall in a swoon. Give me a rope. We must bind him securely, for the devil has put the strength of ten men into him, though but half an hour ago his face was as pale as a moonlight icicle, and he could scarcely walk without being supported. Alas, alas, his face has returned to its former color, his head sinks on his breast, and his limbs are again feeble and listless. I would rather see him fighting like a fiend than see him thus let us move him hence wouldst thou stop to lament over him it was base work in baldwin to betray their plot to the prior for he took their money first i'll be sworn he had betrayed the prior then and all the community besides well let us move him hence this is no business of ours exeunt morant wolverade and soldiers leading out osterloo enter agnes by the grated door and discovers leonora on the ground oh holy virgin on the ground fainting and ill have the barbarians left her thus 
chafing her temples and hand oh, she begins to revive it is me my dearest lady look up and see me those men are all gone and osterloo with them alas he is it is fated so let me lie where i am i cannot move yet my good agnes nay do not yet despair of saving the count leonora starting up and catching hold of her eagerly how so is it possible the travellers arrived at the castle are the imperial ambassador and his train night overtook them on the mountains and they are now making merry in the hall thank heaven for this providence has sent him hither i'll go to him instantly and conjure him to interpose his authority to save the life of osterloo representing his liege lord the emperor the prior dare not disobey his commands and the gates of the monastery will be opened at his call who comes here let us go re-enter morand morand to leonora you are revived again i am glad to see it pardon me lady that i forgot you in your extremity and let me conduct you safely to the castle i thank you but my servants are without let me go don't follow me i pray you let me support you through the porch and i'll leave you to their care since you desire it exeunt leonora supported by morant and agnes scene three a grand hall prepared for the execution soldiers are discovered drawn up on each side of the scaffold with benedict and several of the monks on the front of the stage a bell tolls at measured intervals with a deep pause between after which enter morant hanging his head sorrowfully benedict to morant is he come forth hast thou seen him they are moving him hither but they move slowly thou hast seen him then how does he look now i cannot tell thee these few hours have done on him the work of many years he seems broken and haggard with age and his quenched eyes are fixed in their sockets like one who walks in sleep alas alas how changed in little time the bold and gallant osterloo have i not told thee morand that fear will sometimes couch under the brazen helmet as well as the woolen cowl fear dost thou call it set him this moment in the field of battle with death threatening him from a hundred points at once and he would brave it most valiantly benedict preventing first monk from answering hush brother be not so warm good lieutenant we believe what thou sayest most perfectly the bravest mind is capable of fear though it fears no mortal man a brave man fears not man and an innocent and brave man united fears nothing ay now you speak reason call it fear then if you will but the prior comes let us go to our places they arrange themselves and then enter the prior with a train of monks who likewise arrange themselves a pause in which the bell tolls as before and enter osterloo supported by jerome and paul wovelraid and soldiers following prior meeting him with solemnity count osterloo in obedience to the will of heaven for our own preservation and the just punishment of guilt i am compelled with the monks of this monastery over whom i preside to see duly executed within the time prescribed the dismal act of retribution you have i trust with the help of these holy men as well as a few short moments would allow closed your mortal account with heaven if there be aught that rests upon your mind regarding worldly concerns which you leave behind you unsettled let me know your last will and it shall be obeyed to jerome after pausing for an answer 
do you think he understands me jerome to ostalu did you hear my son what the prior has been saying to you i heard words through a multitude of sounds it was the prior desiring to know if you have any wishes to fulfil regarding worldly affairs left behind you unsettled perhaps to your soldiers you may ostalu interrupting him eagerly and looking wildly round my soldiers are they here i know they are not here they are housed for the night in their distant quarters they will not be here till the setting of to-morrow's sun to-morrow's sun is there any wish you would have conveyed to them are there any of your officers to whom you would send a message or token of remembrance you speak again imperfectly through many ringing sounds is there any wish you would have conveyed to them are there any of your officers to whom you would send a message or token of remembrance ay there is these these endeavouring to tear off his cincture and some military ornaments from his dress i cannot hit upon these fastenings we'll assist you my son undoing his cincture and girdle etc ostalu still endeavouring to do it himself my sword too and my daggers my last remembrance to them both to whom my lord both all of them benedict who has kept sorrowfully at some distance now approaching eagerly urge him no more his officers will themselves know what names he would have uttered turning to ostalu with an altered voice yes noble count they shall be given as you desire with your farewell affection to all your brave followers i thank ye and this is all nay nay what is there besides there is too much of this and some sudden rescue may prevent us nay reverend father there is no fear of this you would not cut short the last words of a dying man and must i be guided by thy admonitions beware though baldwin has not named thee i know it is thou who art the traitor there is but one object at present to be thought of and with your leave reverend father i will not be deterred from it to ostalu again in a voice of tenderness what is there besides noble Osterloo, that you would wish us to do there is something what is it my lord i wot not then let it rest nay nay this this pulling a ring from his finger which falls on the ground my hands will hold nothing i have found it and what shall i do with it leonora leonora i understand you my lord i am under the necessity count osterloo of saying your time is run to its utmost limit let us call upon you now for your last exertion of nature these good brothers must conduct you to the scaffold jerome and paul support him towards the scaffold while benedict retires to a distance and turns his back to it rest upon me my son you have but few paces to go the ground sinks under me my feet tread upon nothing we are now at the foot of the scaffold and there are two steps to mount lean upon us more firmly ostalu stumbling it is dark i cannot see alas my son there's a blaze of torches round you after they are on the scaffold now in token of thy faith in heaven and forgiveness of all men raise up thy clasped hands seeing ostalu make a feeble effort he raises them for him in a posture of devotion and now to heaven's mercy we commit thee jerome and paul retire and two executioners prepare him for the block and assist him to kneel he then lays down his head and they hold his hands while a third executioner stands with the raised axe first executioner speaking close into his ear press my hand when you are ready for the stroke 
a long pause he gives no sign stop he will immediately a second pause does he not no then give him the stroke without it third executioner prepares to give the stroke when the imperial ambassador rushes into the hall followed by a leonora and agnes and the numerous train stop the execution in the name of your liege lord the emperor i command you to stop upon your peril my lord prior this is a treacherous and clandestine use of your seignorial power this noble servant of our imperial master pointing to osterloo i take under my protection and you must first deprive an imperial ambassador of life ere one hair of his head fall to the ground benedict running to the scaffold up noble osterloo raise up thy head thou art rescued thou art free rise noble osterloo dost thou not know the voice that calls thee he moves not he is in a swoon raises osterloo from the block whilst leonora bends over him with anxious tenderness he is ghastly pale yet it surely can be but a swoon chafe his hands good benedict while i bathe his temples after trying to restore him oh no 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 change takes place what thinkest thou of it is there any life here in truth i know not this seems to me the fixed ghastly visage of complete death oh no no he will be restored no stroke has fallen upon him it cannot be death <gasps> is not that something did not his lips move no lady you but deceive yourself they moved not they are closed for ever leonora wringing her hands oh it is so it is so after all thy struggles and exertions of despair this is thy miserable end <laughs> alas alas thou who didst bear thy crest so proudly in many a well-fought field <laughs> this is thy miserable end <laughs> turning away and hiding her face in the bosom of agnes ambassador examining the body more closely i think in very truth he is dead yes the face never looks thus till every spark of life is extinguished ambassador turning fiercely to the prior how is this prior what sorcery has been here that your block alone should destroy its victim when the stroke of the axe has been wanting what account shall i carry to the master of the death of his gallant general no sorcery hath been practised on the deceased his own mind has dealt with him alone and produced the effects you behold and when you return to louis of bavaria your master tell him that his noble general free from personal injury of any kind died within the walls of this monastery of fear nay nay my good prior put the fool's cap on thine own head and tell him this tale thyself fear osterloo and fear coupled together when the lion and the fawn are found couching in the same lair we will believe this all the brothers of the order will attest it away with the testimony of your cowled witnesses beckoning morant to come near morant thou art a brave fellow i have known thee of old thou art the prior's officer indeed but thou art now under my protection and shalt be received into the emperor's service with increased rank speak the truth then boldly how died count osterloo in very truth then my lord according to my simple thoughts he died even as the prior has told you out upon thy hireling's tongue art thou not ashamed thyself wearing a soldier's garb to blast a soldier's fame there is no earthly thing the brave osterloo was ever known to fear you say true my lord and on my sword's point 
I'll maintain it against any man as stoutly as yourself. But here is a pious monk, pointing to Jerome, who will explain to you what I should speak of, but lamely. With the prior's permission, my lord, if you will retire with me a little while, I'll inform you of this mysterious event, even simply as it happened. And perhaps you will then confess that, called upon suddenly, under circumstances impressing powerfully the imagination, to put off this mortal frame and stand forth in that tremendous presence before which this globe, with all its mighty empires, hangs but as a crisped raindrop shivering on the threaded gossamer. The bravest mind may, if a guilty one, feel that within which is too powerful for human nature to sustain. Explain it as thou wilt. I shall listen to thee. But think not to cheat our imperial master of his revenge for the loss of his gallant general. I shall not fail, my lord prior, to report to him the meek spirit of your Christian authority, which has made the general weal of the community subservient to your private revenge, and another month, I trust, shall not pass over our heads, till a worthier man, pointing to Benedict, shall possess this power which you have so greatly abused. Let the body be removed, and laid in solemn state, till it be delivered into the hands of those brave troops who shall inter it with the honours of a soldier. End of Act 3 The End of The Dream by Joanna Bailey 